Hi, I'm just going to put these three topics together, remote labs, virtual reality and augmented reality. They are linked, but the reason I want to just put them together is I think they are of minority interest uh, to most educators, remote labs, um, because it's mostly seen as a topic for engineering and science and even within that for certain topics within engineering and science. So first of all, let's have a look at virtual reality. Um, it's a three-dimensional simulation of reality. Now, we can do this uh, through a two-dimensional computer screen. If you've used, say, Google Maps and you've used Street View, you can go onto Street and look around you. Uh, but they're best done with headsets, virtual reality headsets. Um, they're built they can be built from models, which are really numerical descriptions of reality, uh, but can also be done with three-dimensional photography. You can build the models up that, that way as well. Uh, as I say, with a headset, they're what are, are described as immersive, and people claim that this is much more effective from a learning point of view. And if you have certain devices like haptic gloves or those handheld controllers, it can allow you to interact with the three-dimensional environment that you're in. Now, the problem as I see it with virtual reality, and I think it's a big problem, is it's very expensive to develop, okay? Uh, and I would argue that if you were to bring students visiting a site or to visit certain equipment or to allow them to watch really good videos um, and that afterwards to to allow them access to to a two dimensional simulation would be quite adequate that they would learn as as much as they would with the three dimensional simulation. If you're lucky, by the way, uh, and it's piece of equipment that you want to teach students about, uh, suppliers often provide simulators of that equipment at a much keener price. Augmented reality, I'll just spend a minute on this. This is where that you look at th reality through a device, which could be a phone, or it could be these augmented reality glasses that people have, and uh, it adds extra information. It's a digital overlay of the real world that you're looking at, provides additional information. And to date, the only real use I've seen of augmented reality and training is for on-demand training. And I think it will be extremely powerful for on-demand training, particularly if you're looking at a situation or a piece of equipment, that it will be able to make sense of that and provide you with the help that you need to deal with that, whether it's maintaining a piece of equipment or something more sophisticated, I can't imagine what that would be. Okay, so onto the topic of remote labs, which actually is an important topic for a minority of educators. Sometimes we use the phrase virtual labs. They're not quite the same. Sometimes I use the phrase labs for remote learners. In other words, if we have learners at a distance, you know, how, how can we deal with those? learners at a distance when if they were on campus, they would be spending a lot of time in a lab. If we can solve these problems, it can increase the reach. We can have international students that don't need to travel at all to, to do lab work. But I just want to mention as well is that if we had campus students that had, had online labs, we'll say or virtual labs available to them, they could come pre-prepared to labs and the learning in the lab would be far more effective. Or we may be able to reduce the amount of time they spent in the lab and uh, thus increase the capacity of that lab. So first of all, let's look at the challenges of labs. There's the cost of them. Where do we put them? We need space for them. Uh, because we have so many students that want to use them or because they need supervisors. Uh, the time that students spend on them may be restricted. Uh, uh, they, they may, because they have uh, a limited amount of time in it, they may be less effective than we'd like to be. In fact, it could be as bad that we're giving them instructions that they follow blindly and don't understand what they're doing at all because we need to get them through in a certain time. There is the problem with distance. Students that are far away, can they come to these labs? 
there is the issue of safety as well. And in a way, all these topics are ones, or all these challenges, we'll say, are ones that virtualization and remote access can help us with. So if we look at it from the point of distance learners, because, I mean, it isn't just distance learners, by the way, because it can augment or replace uh, what people do on campus as well. Um, these are solutions or options. So remotely accessible labs, real labs, real equipment, okay, with a camera on it or several cameras on it so we can watch what's going on, um, with measurement devices that maybe feed data out to our computer, and also allowing the student to remotely control certain parameters of that device and examine the effect of, of trying to control it. Okay, so that's real equipment. Then we can have simulations of real equipment, whether they be uh, ones that we buy commercially, and there is a lot of simulations available for free. Uh, not many virtual reality ones, VR ones, because they're ex expensive to develop, but there is lots of two-dimensional uh, simulations of, a, of typical college experiments available for free. Uh, you can have ones that are purely numeric. Okay, they're not visual in a way. In other words, the student inputs numbers to something and it outputs results. It simulates reality and outputs results. Uh, digitized labs are, and, and the ones that I've just described where it outputs results, it usually uses mathematical equations to generate the results. But you can run real labs, take real measurements, have even errors in those measurements, and store those measurements uh, so that when the student comes to do the experiment and they vary the parameters, it picks the, re the appropriate real data from that data bank and feeds it back to the student. So that has errors in it as well. So it seems more real to them. Again, that's sort of data in and data out. You can design kits and send them to students, whether that's an elementary chemistry kit or a robotics kit or whatever. Um, uh, what about not doing real work at all, maybe just showing them videos of situations of equipment and giving them quizzes afterwards to ensure that they pay attention to it because they're not actually manipulating anything themselves or making any decisions themselves. There is a tendency of them not to pay attention. Or we can just do live demonstrations and cross our fingers and hope that they're paying attention. It's a bit like videos in a way. Uh, and what about experiments that they might do at home with equipment? That they're lying, lying around, that you would typically find around the house, whether that's a, a tennis ball on a string to do the simple pendulum or whatever. And of course, a lot of these solutions can be used for our campus students to pre prepare them for coming into a lab, and you might refer to that as flipped labs, so that they get more out of the lab or they get through the lab in a shorter time. Now, if you were thinking about using any of these solutions, to solve a lab challenge, we'll say, I'd, I'd, I would just ask you the question, do you really need a lab? Okay, so let's look at these situations. Familiarization with equipment. And I'm gonna come back to that, okay? Do you really, do you really need laboratory or physical equipment to familiarize people with equipment? Understanding a phenomenon, okay? We know we can show students a video, we can give them a simulation, and then they can experiment to their heart's content with that simulation. So that's possibly a way of getting them to understand phenomena. Understanding measurement, well, we know that we can, actually we can ask them to measure things at home, you know, repeatedly measure and get an understanding of the errors that creep into measurement and the characteristics of those errors as well. Um, interpreting data, well, we can give students data and ask them to interpret it. Do we need them in the lab for that? For testing a hypothesis, maybe we want to develop their scientific mindset. We just ask them to design experiments. There may be other challenges as well, which I can't think of at the moment. But if you look over that list, really, when you think about it, maybe it's familiarization of equipment is the only one that really requires them to be in a lab. Now, that's quite important in a lot of professions that they'd be familiar with familiar with equipment, but that's the only one that really requires them to be in the lab. And even with that, we can shorten the time or increase the impact by using other solutions with that. Thank you very much for watching.